Good day, everyone in your many different locations. Welcome to you all. Um, a note on uh, Blackbird AI. Um, it provides disinformation defense and response uh, across a broad range, national security issue, uh, corporations and so forth, and helps uh, to respond to uh, new cyber attacks and manipulation mechanisms. Um, previous work has focused on COVID-19 and the disorganization and the organization of disinformation. Um, um, Basim Khaled and Blackbird AI uh, produced a um, manipulation index in which they they uh, traced millions of Twitter and other social media accounts worldwide and made an estimate of the degree of manipulation, which ranged from um, 30 to 40 or 60 percent um, and they concerned questions like trust in government reopen the economy and the heading such as the cure is worse than the disease um, media delegitimizing media um, there was also um, uh, a documentary hoax on youtube that they discussed um, on the pandemic um, which related to anti-vax, anti-mask, anti-5G uh, and QAnon issues, delegitimization of Chinese culture. And recently they have worked on um, a major uh, COVID vaccine disinformation account, which is what um, Basim will uh, focus on in particular this afternoon. Basim, you are doing marvelous work and we welcome you. We welcome you also as the employer of a former, um, of, of a <laughs> global studies alumnus, Bert Duffield, who is here. Good to see you. Mark Duffield, good to see you too. Greetings to everybody. Please, a warm welcome to, to Basim Khaled, and congratulations on today's eat. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, and, and great to be here to talk to you all today. Um, you know, appreciate Jan for uh, for inviting and all of the, uh, the the kind of work we've done in the in the COVID space. Um, what I'd like to do today is just kind of start by going through uh, something I've put together just to get people uh, familiarized with the framework of how we think about disinformation and the way in which we approach these problems. So I'm gonna go through a number of slides and then uh, near the end of this, um, certainly we can do a Q&A around our most recent COVID report, if we'd like, um, or anything else that comes to mind based on the ideas that we push out there. So uh, I'm gonna share my screen and, and just uh, jump right in. All right, so... Uh, one second. All right, can everyone see my screen? All right. So, you know, there's very few people that remember that in 1835, New York was uh, buzzing with the discovery that life was discovered on the moon. It was all anyone could talk about. And reports in what was called the New York Sun described sightings of uh, men with bat wings living on the moon's surface. And a well-known astronomer of the time, Sir John Herschel, was said to have made this discovery. The article itself was credited to his colleague, Dr. Andrew Grant. Of course, all the city's papers, they printed responses. Everyone had to weigh in. The news, of course, of life on the moon spread like wildfire, and within months, the true author of the story, a man named Richard Locke, made The Sun, for a very brief time, the most popular newspaper in the world. Now, for the record, of course, none of these discoveries proved true, and Sir Herschel, the astronomer, had no idea what was going on, and his colleague, Dr. Grant, did not exist. Disinformation 
manipulation in the media, it's not anything new. If I asked you though 10 years ago what you thought of this, you might say something about perhaps how gullible the public used to be in the past, but I think in 2021 you might be a little more understanding of these individuals from 100 plus years ago. Because what we've all been experiencing online for the last several years has to really be called out and understood for what it is. And that is information warfare. It is a war. It's a war for mind share and an attack on human perception. Now, there's a lot of ways that organizations and researchers have tried to make sense of what's happening. You've probably seen word clouds as one of those methods that show the frequency of mentions across the social web. The problem with it is it's quite naive. And in fact, the new threats that we face today are problems that can be quite nuanced and complex. Like this COVID-19 anti-vax conspiracy our team has been tracking as it evolves and mutates across the media landscape. And as it turns out, those kind of pretty looking word clouds that a lot of people see are often exactly what an adversary wanted you to see and react to. And of course, that's a big problem. New forms of disinformation and manipulation, they really impact every critical problem that affects society today. And I'm sure a lot of the people in this audience can appreciate that whether it's climate change or radical racial conflict to stock market manipulation, if there's a controversy or regulation or power struggles or large sums of money at stake, there are going to be coordinated efforts to shift public perception. Now, for, for, for some time, there's been this notion that these kind of threats only mattered in politics, but it actually goes far beyond that. Uh, so we talk to organizations all the time that are often confused about why they're being pulled into such highly polarized conversations that kind of seem to come out of left field. Uh, I think there's a lot of confusion around why these things happen, and we've all read things on, you know, why are these parties involved here? But this ignores the current culture of what's actually happening, people's behaviors. Uh, what I tell these organizations that get sideswiped is that it's not really about your company or your brand or your policy, but it's about the goal of the ones that are driving the narrative, right? They wanna find the best medium to attach their message to so that it flies further and faster. And the brand or the person just becomes a catalyst for spreading those messages in that manner. So what better polarizing topics than income inequality, race and climate change or vaccines to help spread that message? Because rage is the perfect medium Rage makes people mash the share button without thinking. And on the other end of the spectrum, humor is another tool, which is why sometimes the methods can also be pretty hilarious by design. And, and whether it's the public financial markets being sideswiped by you know, Reddit users, like in the Game Street and Wall Street bet saga, where you know, online message board users decided to band up and pump a stock, which by the way, ultimately led to a $19 billion loss for investors, or the crypto markets going through the roof when an Elon Musk tweet proclaims Dogecoin, the hottest crypto, pumps the market cap of that to $80 billion. It's a new world in the information space when these kinds of things can even happen. And it's a space that's dominated by a few major content platforms where these kind of new behaviors can completely compromise the ability of systems or researchers and analysts to understand what's really happening under the surface. But if, but if there's one thing that I can really say that all of us should be acutely aware of, it is that if you're on the internet at all, your perception is being manipulated. It doesn't matter what your education level is or geography, Disinformation is manipulating you in ways that you probably don't comprehend. And we'll talk about a few of these things today. Um, you know, most of today's methods to try to understand disinformation at all are extremely vulnerable themselves to manipulation. For us, when we talk to national security organizations or Fortune 500 organizations, we find that they cannot detect these campaigns today in any way, shape, or form. 
when they're invisible, when these threats are invisible to organizations, you can imagine just how little chance the regular individual has in navigating these things successfully. So to have even a shot at understanding disinformation and reacting intelligently, you have to have a pretty deep understanding of the mechanisms and the intent and the drivers. And today's campaigns, very hard to see. They're under the waterline and utilize a pretty wide variety of techniques. One, one thing I tell everyone that it's not just about what is true or false. I think a lot of people think about, you know, is this piece of news true or false? But it's again about narrative manipulation and manufactured narrative conflict and controversy. Again, that drives your message. So whether that's a bot network or, you know, a hashtag on Twitter being hijacked, we're talking about sophisticated, effective tradecraft that has actually improved very drastically over the last few years and are getting a bit more refined every day. And so these new techniques, they utilize technology, they draw on psychology and sociology for maximum impact. And these campaigns are extremely difficult to analyze at scale because of the sheer volume and the magnitude of how they're presented. Now, there's been a lot of progress in how we look at data over the years, but when it comes to kind of social intelligence and disinformation, there's a lot of things organizations have to evolve past. Everyone looks at volume, engagement, you've probably seen sentiment as another thing that people try to gauge. But trending has to evolve to identify things like bot networks and hashtag hijacking. But what, what good is understanding what's trending if you understand that maybe 80% of that is driven by a bot network. It's not the authentic kind of voice of the masses, but rather one actor working in concert to spread a message. Uh, things like sentiment, you know, emotive, happy, sad type things have to evolve to understand language and linguistics that reflect toxic language, hate, stance, for example, adversarial, controversial language. And engagement, which is, you know, what everybody's been using for years now in advertisements, it has to evolve to understanding what, you know, our team calls cohorts. These are communities that behave similarly. Think of them as tribes um, that believe the same things, right? Um, and what we're really looking at is what we have a very close eye is where these future threats are going. Because we're really only at the start of what information warfare is evolving towards, which is automated computational propaganda. So I wanted to spend just a little bit talking about this, because I think today a lot of people talk about bots, but today's bots are actually not that sophisticated, especially when you think about scripted Twitter accounts or things of that nature. Where we're actually going is a truly weaponized AI. We get closer and closer to full automation of text, image, audio, and social propagation with a few clicks and some simple instructions, which could really effectively flood the zone with magnitudes more noise than any human or current system is really capable of handling. So it would really inundate our ability to differentiate fact from fiction in the information landscape today. To give you just a little bit of an example, of the dangers of AI generated disinformation. Let me read you some of these thoughts. We'll start with Dr. Oscar Hudson. We will require the development of new technologies to counter the effects of AI and deep fakes. We need to find ways to identify fake news, identify social bots and track them. And we need to find ways to identify people who are susceptible to disinformation and find ways to talk to them. Janet Scott, disinformation campaigns will be used to create the impression that an opinion trend or event is popular, which will erode public trust in traditional media and people will be less likely to seek out the truth. Our biases and prejudices will be reinforced by AI. So I'm gonna stop here for a second. You're probably wondering, well, who are these people? Well, that's good because if you're questioning it, then I would tell you that these people don't exist. Okay, we, we created their faces with the GAN generator, deep fakes, 
on thispersondoesnotexist.com. It's a real website. <laughs> and the expert comments were generated by GPT-3, which is the best generative text AI today. And those AI generated comments were based on my notes for this presentation in about 20 minutes. Okay, this guy sounded pretty good, right? So here's the thing. This was 30 minutes of total work, no budget. One could add a few Ivy League University logos, buy 10,000 or so followers on Twitter, build some legitimacy. And if we wanted to maybe get more sophisticated, hire a team out of the Ukraine or China for $20,000 to build a bot campaign and astroturf these narratives to audiences that we might want to manipulate and influence. And that is available now, right? And that should be just a little bit of an indication on where this might be going in the next five to 10 years. Because if this continues, it's going to render, again, the information ecosystem unfit for consumption and current intelligence and research efforts will be rendered effectively useless unless technology keeps pace. So look, all is not lost, right? Uh, Jan was actually asking me just a little while ago how concerned I am about all of these things. And I, I'd say that the more we look at this space and the more we learn, as much as it is concerning, it gives us the ability to get an understanding of what's actually happening. Because the real goal here is to overcome the efforts that are driving manipulation. And the only way to do that is through the quantification of the driving mechanisms, right? Now, our team's research and development over the past six years internally with the Department of Defense and other organizations have led us to a set of quantifiable metrics. And I'd like to share some of these with you today um, to just convey that it's not all doom and gloom, right? So um, one approach we use are uh, some unique signal fusions across four core categories that if processed at scale across multiple platforms can bring some order to this chaos. So these four signals are narratives, networks, cohorts, and manipulation. I'm going to talk a little bit about those. So if you think about narratives, they're the conversations that are relevant. Networks are relationships between users and the concepts that they share with one another. And cohorts are the affiliations that reflect like the affinities of a tribe, a group of people that are talking about the same things, interested in the same things. And manipulation, finally, that we've spent quite a bit of time on which drives influence, which serves to amplify or dampen expression. So if we take all four of these in concert, you can actually find out quite a bit about the mechanisms and the drivers and the intent of disinformation and manipulation campaigns, which in turn helps you to understand what kind of harm these things might do, helps you to do that faster and with more accuracy and confidence. Now, if we then kind of try to understand these types of signals and understand the mechanisms, then you can then get clear guidance on how to react. So whether you're a social platform that needs to moderate content and accounts better, or if you want to react uh, in a proactive way instead of reactive, it will allow you to do this by understanding these types of more nuanced signals and getting more context on what's actually happening. So key narratives being said, including critical pieces of disinformation and hoaxes that might be mutating across the information space, being able to verify the drivers like influencer accounts or low level accounts. If you can see the metrics around influence and impact across a large variety of topics, it can make a world of difference in getting to ground truth. And so, Understanding the mechanisms are really what enables organizations and individuals to build some sort of a, a mental framework to address these threats head on, which is exactly what organizations need to do. Now, I'm not gonna dig into each one of the four signals uh, I went into a little too deep, but I, I'd like to talk about cohorts for a minute because it's a really important one. So I'm just gonna expand a little bit on this. Um, you can think of cohorts as tribes, again, that have the same interests. They're online communities. Um, maybe it's a community of sports fans or tech enthusiasts, which 
traditionally have been identified for product marketing in the ad space. Or they could be a community of extremists that are being targeted by QAnon. Now, we, we can't really talk about disinformation without talking a little bit about QAnon, a great example of a cohort or a tribe, one that can cause a lot of damage. So great example, QAnon attacks a 100-year-old organization, Save the Children, by co-opting their name into a hashtag. I mentioned hashtag hijacking. Why did they do this? They used it as a soft front for recruitment to their extreme ideas. Why does disinformation impact so many people? Because it can be attached to ideas that they already might believe in. The celebrities, the influencers, and companies that were jumping on the Save the Children hashtag and campaign had no clue about the QAnon connection. But their posts actually helped drive the popularity of the hashtag with the message attached, like I mentioned before, and pulled in all kinds of new audiences, particularly younger women on this particular cause, who were sympathetic. And then once these new communities started looking at Save the Children content, they encountered more and more QAnon theories. And in fact, one of the things that are in disinfo circles we all found fascinating was something called pastel QAnon, right? I mean, and, and it kind of reflects how polarizing ideas can spread like an infection from community to community. So the, what, what happened here was the QAnon cohort built up a soft look and feel to spread the same conspiracies that they always did, but now instead of militant message boards, they were popping up on Peloton forums they were circulating on Instagram influencer accounts, and they were gaining traction with anti-vaxxers, yoga communities, and even new mothers. These were the targeted cohorts. And what this should tell you is that these actors are strategic. They think like marketers almost, and they're very good at what they do because all of these groups started getting pulled into QAnon belief systems. And even to this day, anti-vax and COVID conspiracies proliferate wildly in kind of suburban soccer mom and yoga groups on Facebook and online. So, you know, I'm kind of just uh, concluding on a few things here. I think, you know, human nature is to really always be thinking and to, to make sense of our world. We're all constantly thinking about something. The thing is, the things that receive your attention really determine who you are. It's often the case that you become what you pay attention to. It's really what defines you. And we today live in a society that is driven by the pursuit of our attention. It's an attention economy, and our attention is really the currency. So there's a lot of different companies and apps and advertisements that are all fighting for that attention. What modern disinformation does is it hijacks this system, this culture, if something like a conspiracy wins your attention over and over, you, you kind of become that conspiracy. That's why there's so much time and energy from threat actors to develop and engineer methods that can affect one community, one cohort, one tribe at a time with the idea that they want to drive. And when they do it successfully, they work very well. It's why the US Capitol was raided it's why during a pandemic, you see attacks on doctors and people wearing masks. When I say that disinformation is an attack on human perception, that's exactly what I mean. These campaigns are designed to capture your attention, to prey on your fears so that you pay attention to it, become consumed, and inadvertently spread that infection to your friends, to your family, and to your community at large. So, I mean, in conclusion, I just want to close by saying that I strongly believe that we don't have to live in a post-truth world. By facing these problems head on, investing in education, more advanced technology and frameworks, we can engage successfully in this battle of the narratives. No one really wants to live in a world where everything is a hoax, a world where you can't trust anyone or anything. Me personally, I believe strongly that disinformation is one of the existential problems of our time. They don't only impact brands and governments and financial markets, but also ultimately they affect our relationships with one another. 
So if, if we want to move from information disorder to information integrity, then we actually have quite a lot of work to do. And there's really no time to lose on it. So that's you know the, the, the presentation I wanted to give to you today. And happy to have an open discussion on any of the things that we've talked about on our recent COVID report or anything else that this might have uh, kind of struck a nerve on. Basim, that is so insightful and so pertinent. Let me slip in a first question and then Marcus. My question, my, my first question, Basim, unfit for consumption, are you referring to the internet or to social media and the defense techniques to generate information integrity are can, can they be available to individuals like ourselves listening listening to you or does it require considerable technical savvy and investment well, that's a great question so when i when i talk about the the ecosystem i'm talking about a combination of social media and news perhaps not the entire internet but in some ways social media and news have taken over the internet um, and, and they kind of reach into every corner of it. So the information ecosystem is at threat of having any value if it can be saturated with so much noise that you can't differentiate anything of value from it, right? Which you know usually results in people just shutting off and not paying attention to it at all, which I'm sure many of you have heard people say, hey, I'm, I don't watch the news at all anymore. Well, that's, that's one of the goals too, because an uninformed person is easier to control, right? Um, so, so that's a success in itself. Um, when it comes to tools for individuals, um, you know, our organization, for example, today doesn't provide um, individual tools because there's more work to be done um, before that can be foolproof. Because if I provided you with something today and it was wrong once or twice, you would discount it forever, right? And so the, the technology and the mechanisms need to get stronger before we can deploy them to the end user. But there's a lot of things that people can do to educate themselves, to be able to understand um, the types of things that I've been talking about here. And we have a lot of these things on our website, resources that um, you know anyone's free to take a look at um, to, to understand some of the, the tells and the things you should look for. Um, but down the road, we expect to have um, tools that individuals can use to also assess the content that they're looking at online. Azim, thanks. Marcus, please. Thank you, Vasim. This is truly fascinating. Um, I very much enjoyed your talk. I'm now trying to spin um, those dynamics a little bit further into the future because I wonder how is that, you know, um, getting into some sort of a, the, the next stage or the next play? Um, I mean, on one hand, probably it's a bit of a cat and mouse game between researchers and those who invent the next generation of the bots ever more sophisticated. Um, and you, you know, trying to figure it all out, how it is mm -hmm. being done, how to measure it. Mm -hmm. And maybe the other side is trying to hide their tracks to make it, you know, less detectable. But how do you view it? Who has then more um, of a power source? Um, because I mean, it, I understand from what you say, um, it is somewhat affordable, you know, to uh, create all those bots and so on. So I would think in years to come, any, you know, actor, political party, somebody who has a, you know, something to push an agenda um, would want to use those tools. And we would see more and more actors and counter actors and maybe a kind of information warfare, bots against the bots. Um, but more in control are those who control the platforms themselves. Um, the owners of Twitter, the owners of Facebook. So how do you see that? Couldn't they, you know, um, actually really tweak it more, um, crack down on those, let's say, bot owners, bot directors they dislike, but maybe allow to thrive um, the wing that they actually like to see succeed mm -hmm. or even themselves, you know, mounting a political campaign, but yet more power than 
um, the, those who are in control of the platform would be, of course, the political regulators who could simply um, shut down a platform, at least within, um, you know, a national firewall, a national um, legislative um, order. How do you see um, those dynamics um, playing out? Yeah, these are things that we think about quite a bit. Um, you had a couple of pieces to that. I think one was, you know, bot-like and future of potential computational propaganda, um, the platform's ability to moderate um, and why maybe they're not doing as good a job as they could, and, uh, and then regulation around that. So those are all great questions. I would say um, we think about where this is going a lot in terms of the technology component. So you're exactly right in that this is a escalation of uh, weaponization of information, right? Um, and it is a cat and mouse thing. It is very much like cybersecurity, black ops, white ops type, um, type war gaming, right? Um, and so that will continue to evolve. The cost for sophisticated campaigns, though, will also increase because the detection methods are going to get better and better on the lower end of the spectrum. So they just won't be as useful. And in fact, a lot of the uh, things that we saw happen in 2016, platforms are already pretty good at filtering it out. Like a lot of the ad revenue generating blogs, you don't really see those as much um, on social platforms anyway, because they've gotten better at screening it out. But what we're really concerned about, some of the things I mentioned is fully AI generated disinformation campaigns. If anyone has looked at what you can do with OpenGPT-3 and be able to kind of generate um, content and even entire websites, those are the kind of things you have to be very concerned about. And you'll need better and better tools to be able to detect fully AI generated content. Whereas today we're really aimed at looking at human generated content that has had you know light technical work to build the bot networks. So um, it will be a weapons escalation um, for sure in the near future, right? Um, for the platforms, they are definitely in a tight position. I certainly wouldn't want to be the platform um, because they're stuck between moderation, freedom of speech, partisan politicians that could regulate them more aggressively based on what they you know, censor and what they don't. And so they're constantly turning the dials back and forth based on which way the wind is blowing that week, right? And that is why you see such an irregular uh, set of policies being applied to the decisions that they make because there is no playbook. They're kind of making it up as they go along because they don't really have a choice. Um, they have not been the best stewards of our information or privacy by any means, but they also didn't expect for all this to happen, right? What they built was a very sophisticated ad targeting system that was hijacked in a way that they weren't really expecting. And so they're playing catch up. And in fact, the whole white ops defense side is playing catch up because no one really knows how long they've been doing this, right? It's just become a thing now, but this could have been going on since the early days of social media by people who were savvy to the methods of the, the, the game, right? Um, and, and finally, on the on the regulation side, they're playing it by ear too, right? Um, they don't want to censor the public, um, and so they've got. It's going to be a back and forth between the platforms and the the governments that regulate them. I guess the last thing to say though is, even if one platform figures it out or makes it a little better, problem is you have to have a really kind of holistic view on the entire ecosystem. So if something starts in a fringe group, makes its way onto a more mainstream social platform like a Reddit and then onto a Twitter, that's when it then usually jumps onto a mainstream media source like your nightly news. More people see it, they start talking about it on social media and it kind of fuels that fire again. So you'd need a, a wider look than even what one social platform could fix. Because if they do fix it, they're certainly not going to make it available to other organizations, and it really wouldn't even make sense outside of their own platform. So I hope that answers uh, some of your key areas there. Super. I see a question from Trey Nankur, and then I have another one. I have a question, maybe Brad later. Trey Nankur, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay. Thank you for the talk. It was really great. I had actually a couple of questions. One question is that apart from looking at disinformation campaigns and blocking them, is it also a time for uh, new models of literacy and new models of general intellect, uh, which may prevent, you know, a technology, I mean, technological solution is important to disinformation campaigns. But is it also time for new models of literacy and new models of general intellect? That's one question. The other question is that, is it also connected to, let's say th these kinds of conspiracy theories are always connected to questions of deep state or big capital. And they are also, I mean, in media studies, they're also inevitably connected to the question of privacy or secrecy for that matter, the ways in which legality and all kinds of uh, technological barriers create this, uh, barrier of privacy and secrecy, which kind of generates these kinds of conspiracy. So do we need to look beyond the models of privacy and secrecy that exist to protect the state and big capital uh, to fight this really thoroughly? Let's say. Well, yeah, no problem. So, you know, in terms of, I suppose in terms of how you would Models of intellect, right? I mean, we were talking a little bit about this before the, the call started up. I and mean, one of the things we found really interesting in, in the state capital raid is, um, and I think this was in the, the email circulation, is that a lot of people think that it's the uneducated that are taken by these conspiracies. There were CEOs, there were doctors, there were lawyers that were all charged as part of that raid. Um, and you know, traditionally, those are those are labels that we we tend to think have more, uh, you know, kind of thinking power. Right. But the fact is, when it comes to conspiracies that are properly aligned with your confirmation biases and with the things that you want to believe, intellect doesn't help. Right. Um, and in fact, um, almost defenseless if privy to the right narrative if it's put in front of you in the right way. And so education is important, um, but framing in terms of new models of intellect, it's, it's more about teaching specifically about the underlying mechanisms of what's being done. I think one thing that's universal is nobody likes to be manipulated, right? And if they can have a better sense of when they are, um, they're going to change their behavior, um, ideally, um, to not be manipulated if they, if they, can, if they can avoid it. Um, so, you know, uh, I think your, your other question, um, had to do with, uh, with, sorry, uh, barriers of, of kind of privacy and, and secrecy, right? Um, I guess the only thing I would tell you there is, um, we're going to see a lot of these groups being driven further underground due to their need to be more encrypted. Um, and monitored less due to the nature of public social media. And so it's a very, it's a very specific trade-off. As you push these people off mainstream platforms, they'll go underground and still communicate there in places that are less easy to detect, right? So um, they, they're basically going where you can't watch them um, in some ways. And this is not a new thing. This has happened every time there's been a... Um, government crackdown on a particular group, be it extremists or you know, white supremacists, they end up, you know, kind of going more underground, um, and then you have to do more work to actually track uh, what they're uh, planning or or plotting. Right. So, hope that answers it. About Sim, let me slip in a question. Also, yesterday, I received from a dear colleague a distinguished scholar in the Netherlands, a book proposal on, and the theme was, anti-vaccine. Why take an experimental drug, that you know, et cetera, et cetera. This was very, very concerning because these kind of sentiments play a part here in Spain, in many countries, and it makes me think of how truth has been a frontier through the centuries. In ancient Greece, the sophists were accused of manipulating truth. 
can we talk about this in terms of, let's call it progress. Now we have the AI ecosystem and frontier that we are talking about. And if this then, if this, these forms of manipulation by comparison to the sophists, well, they are progress. We should also talk about the dialectics of progress in relation to this manipulation. What are our tools of emancipation? And you have already uh, neutralized some of these tools and in the chat also certificates. Uh, are, all of that is subject to fakes and deep fakes. Um, then where are we? What kind of progress are we a part of? And we are not just victims, we are also agents in this dialectics. Where are we on this frontier of truth? So if we want to get into kind of discourse between parties or, or, or the dialectics, I think this is something we studied a lot in the, especially our early formation years, because all of this is about discourse between usually two very adversarial groups, since polarization is the medium for which all of these types of narratives spread. Um, I think when you mention COVID in particular, um, and maybe we could use that as a, as a jump off point, right? I think it's the perfect example for um, how disinformation can be tied uh, and discourse can be tied between uh, members of society around something that presents a large amount of fear and again, our attention being driven always to one topic, right? So I'm pretty sure almost everyone here, when you talk to someone today that you haven't spoken to in a while, COVID is going to come up. You've gotten the vaccine, what vaccine have you received? Do you know anyone who's had it maybe in the early days? And so it's a focal point, it's an attention point. And so what tends to happen is since COVID-19 has created an environment that the world has never really experienced before, the fears, the massive lifestyle changes, they've really laid this kind of foundation of uncertainty that contributes to the believability of conspiracies, hoaxes, and scams that are attached to COVID, right? And so this gives threat actors a direct path to connect anything to the thing that you fear or to the thing that you pay attention to or the thing that you have a strong opinion about. So when you come back to truth and, and discourse between parties, I think the biggest issue that people have to I think, understand and remember is that the position that they take, if it's so strong that it, it distorts your judgment, distorts things that you receive from parties that you previously trusted because it does not align with your world belief, world view, or your sentiment that this is what I think is right, that's probably the biggest fracture that we've seen um, in terms of how discourse can't actually occur between two parties anymore, whether it's two individuals or two entire political parties or two countries. These are things that we see both at a, at a micro and a macro level as a result of uh, this type of polarization and attachment of uh, this attachment of how can we tweak this person in a way that will drive them to stand firm on their on their belief system, even if it is the opposite of what they're seeing from the world around them, right? And that's kind of the, the, the reality distortion that people are often finding themselves in, is taking this position, even if they know in their, in their minds that they don't agree with it, just to be right, right? Um, and that's something that's hard to snap out of once someone kind of ends up in that, in that cycle. About Sim uh, and then Marcus, um, in science and social science, we use paradigms, models, and they index and organize information for us and help us overcome uncertainty and confusion. Manipulation does the same thing, indexes information, supplies certainty in a context of uncertainty. So manipulation and paradigms, our mind is constantly on the edge of certainty, uncertainty. And we are in this condition 
including all our higher education and knowledge industries permanently. The only difference is the AI frontier and the new tools. Am I right to say this or am I blurring things? I think the behaviors that we see are universal and have been historically present. It's the medium that's different. So I'll give you an example. So people tend to gossip and they tend to spread rumors. So if we want to take away the vernacular of narratives and manipulation and we and fake news and disinformation and we go back to gossip, the gossip mill and the rumor mill, whether you're at a workplace or in family gatherings, these are things that have thrived for a long time because people like, a lot of people like talking about those things because it's controversial, because it's a little bit out of the norm, um, because it's maybe something you have to whisper about. It's something that people have the proclivity to enjoy, right? That's just how it's been for a very, very long time. Now, um, you have also the media ecosystem, which traditionally, since the early days, has had moderators in the middle. You've had the editor, you've had a team of editors often, um, and they will decide what the public consumes. Now, for better or for worse, social media has democratized the spread of information. It sounds like a good thing, right? I mean, we all believe it's a good thing, <laughs> um, but it comes with the lack of that moderation or, or, or the lack of those arbiters of truth or, or fact checking, right? So now you have a scenario where you have a global system where anybody can jump on and not only consume, but create. And so every single person, as we've heard in years past as a positive thing, is now a, a citizen journalist. Again, citizen journalism sounds good until you realize that any citizen can also take on the credibility of a journalist, but say whatever they want. And now you go back to that mentality of, rumors and gossip mills and people start to think about, well, how can I make a quick buck off of this? Well, I can get people's attention by saying X, Y, and Z. And the problem is that now this system that initially seemed like a democratized and open, uh, censor free environment, which all sounds good and free becomes also a a landmine of opportunities for people who might want to exploit the unsuspecting individual who cannot differentiate between what they're seeing on a news site and a simulated news site. And perhaps they're making money off you. Perhaps they're furthering someone else's agenda. And that's the scenario that, that, that we kind of end up in. Right. And that's how we've kind of come to where we're at today. So it's not new but the medium and the platform is very different and it can scale much, much faster than it ever has. It can go around the world in seconds. Um, yeah. and that's the issue. Right? Yeah. Uh, please. Uh, uh, thanks for him. Uh, Kim and then Marcus, please Kim. You are, uh, un unmute, unmute, unmute. Kim. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm enjoying this very much. So thank you, Wilson. No problem. Uh, there's a, 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 another, another approach that I would like to raise, though, in this information disinformation that I've noticed is saying taking sites that are seen as legitimate and where they're manipulating stuff. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. uh, I read the New York Times. As we know, the Times is probably the, I would say, the best paper in the pa in the country, blah, blah, blah. On some things, they're really, really good. But also, there are issues that they're totally unreliable on. You cannot trust the Times on Venezuela. You cannot trust them on the Middle East. You can't trust them on Russia. You can't trust them on the Uyghurs. So we've got a thing where a generally legitimate source, one that's valued as a truth teller, which is using that capability 
um, to spread rumors, misinformation, et cetera, around other areas that they have. I mean, part of this is, is you know, when we're thinking of the mass media, of course, we've got to recognize they have their own interests and their interests aren't always telling the truth. How does this fit in there? Or does it? <laughs> well, I'm trying to think of the best. Well, look, I'll, I'll just tell you what I think about this particular topic. And this is more uh, just my opinion than anything else. The New York Times is a business and a business model cannot include both unfettered honest journalism and unfettered profit. The two philosophies are diametrically opposed. Um, you can kind of relinquish quality for quantity, and this is the basis for the popularity of misinformation or the need to avoid controversy in the case of some of those topics that you just mentioned. So if you think of media sources as having become divisions of marketing and then kind of seeking out and creating the filter bubbles that they know will bring the big payoffs while ignoring other types of news that may be important, but either less profitable or highly controversial that can bring maybe the social media mobs after them. They often take the safer path. They have shareholders to answer to. They're doing, I should say, many, especially at the journalist level, the best they can. But, you know, that's the trade-off where you do have editors that are making decisions on a number of things. And I'm not saying that, you know, one particular organization um, would suppress something that they think is very critical. But, you know, like you said, not everyone represents all of those stories in the same way. And there are always reasons for that. So I suppose media was once the baseline landscape for the formulation of opinions and ideas. But now it's really more social media and the trends for the moment that are influencing everything else and ad revenue through social platforms are what the news media makes the majority of their money off of. So the same platform that killed traditional journalism is also the platform they're dependent on for the majority of their revenue. So you can see how um, it, it does kind of end up being one of those things that is, I think, highly financially driven, financially motivated. Thanks. Please, let's do David Willis and Dan Marcus, please, David. Uh, thank you so much, Wasim. Thank you, Jan. Thank you so much, Wasim. Really important work that you're doing. I have to think that I'm, oh, well, I'm worried about you. I'm worried about Blackbird. I'm worried about the Greek messenger. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, it'd be interesting to hear your comment on that. But my question is about the deplatforming of Trump. And what happened with that? It was just astonishing. It went from huge noise to you know very small amount of noise. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about that. What what that means? What what we have learned from that? What we can learn from that? What might happen next? And I'm also curious about the pipeline hacking that's just happened and what's going on with Palestine and Israel. I'm sorry, I give you too much there, but you know, <laughs> here we are. I, yeah, yeah, I maybe uh, was it maybe combined with uh, Marcus. Uh, follow-up question, Marcus. Uh, yeah, um, my question started off from when when you covered COVID, um, and my question you can probably um, label or you have a motto or a hashtag um, limits of framing. So what I'm interested in is whether um, any topic could be like framed in any kind of a way, or whether there are limits to it. I mean, um, Napoleon, you know, had been poking fun at the ideologues, a group of philosophers by saying, you guys, you only have ideas, you only do the talk, but I have the real power. So there can be um, um, possibilities to frame and create a reality. Trump was very good in, you know, simply creating a different reality if the facts didn't really fit uh, with, you know, um, uh, what, how he wanted uh, them to have. Um, the Soviet Union was very good with the Bravda, um, but there were also limits to it. And when it comes to COVID, and maybe now in India, we have a real-time experience, uh, experiment where we can see whether Modi succeeds in having the great narrative that, um, you know, uh, not so much uh, of uh, um, deaths are happening, 
or whether on such a scale the immediate experience of people is um, um, sort of superseding any kind of uh, social media fictional reality that's being uh, created there. So my question essentially is whether um, it is independent of a topic or whether uh, some types of uh, aspects, topics, matters resist more than others the ability uh, of manipulation. So that would be, um, I think, most relevant to the COVID uh, research. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I'm going to try to go back and, and try to answer both of those here a little bit here. So, um, so to answer David, uh, at least one, one aspect of, of what you had mentioned before there, um, the deep platforming, right? And just talk about deep platforming in general, right? I think it's just a testament to how powerful social media platforms have become, right? Um, you know, kind of shows you who the real emperor is because unless you have a voice and again going back to this notion of the fact that we live in an attention driven culture unless you can garner attention you don't have power today right and so for the same reason that social platforms can completely cut someone off um, and make them irrelevant it, it's the same thing that turned upside down gives social media itself uh, relevance and power from the positive perspective that the that any individual or group of individuals can actually make enough noise about a particular concern to be heard right and so this is just one of those things that are going to be a back and forth struggle um, for the companies kind of relates to the powers of regular regulators and platforms why they don't do one thing versus the other when they take an action they'll be hated by one group if they don't take actions they'll be hated by another group and that's again why i wouldn't want to be the platform right um, in terms of, of, uh, of Marcus's question on uh, uh, India as a real-time experiment, um, it's not the only country, right, during COVID where what the, the, the narrative at large um, and the facts on the ground have differed with such magnitude. But I mean, in this case, I think everyone has seen that play out enough times to where the world started talking about it real fast and kept the... You know, kind of kept the lens on what's actually happening. I've certainly seen far more, at least I don't have an experience inside the country, but from outside, the rest of the world, I think, sees very clearly what's happening there. I haven't seen anybody mobilize. I haven't seen any other country having issues where the world kind of mobilized as quickly as they did with India, which means the story is getting out and being told in the right way. Right? Um, but in terms of, um, you know, the the message and how it's, it's subverted. I think you were talking about how things can be taken out of context, how you can take something that is one context and, and manipulate it to be a completely different context. And that's a whole kind of field to itself. But I think one thing to say is it's really easy to take almost any piece of content, whether it's genuine or actually relevant to your concerns, and then add a different flip of context, whether it's a photo that's being misattributed um, on, as to what's happening or an article where it says one thing, but the context of the post or the article says something else and uses it as a backup reference because they know people won't dig into it and the headline's close enough. It's just something that I think, by and large, for a lot of people is about short attention spans, lack of time, lack of desire to dig further. If they dug just a little further, they would be able to see uh, more context into what they're actually about to share or believe. Right. Um, so that's partly on the platform, partly on the individual too, to be a little more careful on, on what they start to, to pay attention to. Right. Thanks. Uh, Brett, over to you. Yeah. So I guess so it, it's obviously in the interest of governments to control certain narratives, to fight against certain you know disinformation. Um, and kind of the way I see it right now is that there's basically like three kind of models that are emerging. It seems, you know, in China, um, you're going to, China's sort of following this model of censorship and sort of exerting control over specific narratives. You know, it's like a certain narrative emerges and they're just gonna shut it down. Um, there's sort of the EU model, which is kind of emerging, which seems to be holding platforms accountable for what's being spread on the platform. Um, and this is sort of 
seems like it's more in the stages of its infancy for holding platforms accountable. Um, and then there's the US model, which you know follows FCC section 230, you know, platforms can't be held accountable for what's you know speech that's on their platform. And I know there's been talk about sort of repealing that, but it seems like that's sort of where we're at. Um, so if I'm a government and I'm interested in shutting down a certain narrative that seems to be seems to pose some sort of an existential threat, you know, kind of following the um, the 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 capital insurrection, um, you know, why? Right now, it seems like the most appropriate or attractive model for me is to do what China does, you know, buy buy some sort of follow follow China's lead in controlling narratives and shutting them down uh, as soon as possible. But I guess I'm curious, like, how do you see these sort of like models? Do you, do you feel like my my conceptualization here is correct? Or what's, I guess, what's to stop the China model from being the most attractive way to stop disinformation from, from spreading? Well, certainly the most authoritarian countries are going to have the best handle on stopping the spread of any information really that they deem don't want to be spread, right? And the reason for that is simply because they, they control that entire pipeline. They can cut it off at will, right? And we've heard for years various countries, you know, shutting off Twitter, shutting off Facebook, or in the case of China, of course, they never had it to begin with, right? Um, I think, you know, criminalizing access to information and things of that nature is going to be something that's going to be deployed by more and more countries. Um, you do have the characterization, right, in terms of, you know, those the three countries there and kind of the approach that they're taking. Um, you know, it's a kind of Europe is heavy regulation, U.S. is light regulation until they have to regulate more. Um, and, uh, and certainly China just does what they want, right? Um, and so... I would hope it really does depend on the stewards of power in each country um, as to wanting to adopt such an aggressive model as China's. I, really, I don't think that that's you know, the right way, obviously, because it's just over censorship and it's, at least for countries like the US and Europe, is, is kind of contrary to the type of free speech and, and, and kind of language that you'd want. But you do have to hold the platforms a bit more accountable monetarily and again comes down to that 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 fining is what works right singapore has the pofma law which specifically finds instances of disinformation things of that nature um so those things work right seatbelt fines worked it, you know if you, if you go back to these old analogies seatbelts were around for quite a bit of time it's a really great case study around seatbelts if you look back there was a massive amount of disinformation being spread around um you know seat belts are restricting our freedoms literally and figuratively right we should be able to decide if we want to take the risk sounds familiar right in, in the last year right um, it wasn't until they dropped the 50 dollar fine that people decided okay i'm going to wear the seat belt right um even though there was a large amount of information that clearly showed that it's going to likely save your life right so it wasn't the notion that you know this is a good idea. It's going to save my life, my family's life. It's the fifty dollar fine. So I go back to, you know, that's the system that's going to probably have the most impact is figuring out what you have to pay for if you're a platform um, that um, you know kind of goes uh, without saying that that's probably the only model that's going to work, right? So yeah, I hope that that helps. Incentives, uh, structure of incentives. Um, if we think Wasim of network Wasim of network analysis, a classic argument was back to the 1950s Baran's analysis. Um, a network with a single center is the most vulnerable. Distributed centers are uh, or multi-centric is less vul vulnerable to external attack, and the the distributed center is the least vulnerable. Now we have distribution in the extreme. So we need an organization of the distribution, of the distribution of citizen journalists, etc., quote unquote. And so 
you were saying add an incentive structure, but how do you organize the incentive so that you have the right target? Seat well, belts are, are easy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you know what? I don't have a good answer for that one. And I think everyone is trying to figure that one out, right? Um, if you're talking about from a perspective of actually understanding via a network perspective, right, and not the individual platforms, I think one of the things that are notable is that, as you mentioned, the the nodes on the outside of the network, um, they are actually being targeted in kind of micro clusters today, right? Because the idea is how can you infect as many of the clusters, even the less vulnerable ones, over time with the idea. And what you were describing there is a, it's a really good method to see that, like, if you look at something like QAnon and the way that any conspiracy spreads very rapidly throughout the world, that a lot of the the areas, the surface areas that used to seem less vulnerable have become made more vulnerable by the mutation of one said narrative to then saturate the rest, right? Um, now, in terms of how to best come up with that incentive model, that's going to be up for grabs. We're going to have to see how, how that develops um, in the coming years, right? I, I don't have a good answer for that today. Thanks, Rashim. Uh, please, uh, uh, friends, colleagues, floor is open. Marcus. I was just reading the chat and I saw a great question by uh, Daniel Palm. Uh, who brought up uh, Merkel as a very um, interesting uh, case because she doesn't really go too often out into the public. Um, a televised speech by her is a very rare kind of an event and yet her approval ratings are so high. So his question actually puts in my mind that, yeah, for you know fringe conspiracy theories such as QAnon, there's probably a certain threshold um, how many followers they can get. So I think um, their role is more like, wow, you can capture a kind of a fringe sec segment, um, you know, a few percentages of an electorate, which is already quite a large number. And I think this is like a monkey wrench in the whole machinery. Um, probably not possible, you know, to capture majorities because then the narrative would have to better integrate with the real experience. Um, so that would be my uh, comment to that, and maybe back to Vazim. Yeah, uh, you know, I think one of the things that we actually explored a little bit in our most recent COVID report, which is the fourth in our series, COVID Disinformation Report, um, in the initial ones, we looked at a lot of these kind of wilder, you know, QAnon-like conspiracies, call them kind of sensational conspiracies, okay? We all saw these, is my guess. The COVID vaccine implants nanotech that tracks where you go, and it somehow has something to do with 5G towers, right? We saw a lot of these things going, but those are not like the ones that are really are, are the ones that are really concerning. I think the ones that can saturate the masses are presented more professionally and with a straight face, right? By what we're seeing often are like in our in our report, we actually highlight a few examples, but clout chasing accredited professionals now, right? Who might have doctor in their title, who are literally attempting to build a business and a brand around the believers of disinformation. Often they're selling some sort of a pill or a cure preventative for COVID or just selling high price masks and things of that nature. I use COVID as, uh, as an example because um, I think it's a, it's, it's a really good one where you can take a more realistic sounding piece of content for the benefit of, you know, maybe financial or kind of professional standing, building an audience with the believers of conspiracies. Um, and, and these are more like a little bit lighter than the more QAnon like ones, which have a smaller group of people. So I, I guess the, the, the thing I would say here is, it doesn't need to be the wildest conspiracy to cause like a, a, a dire threat when it comes to something like, say, not wearing a mask, right? 
um, you have different grades of conspiracies that attract different people. And that actually links to what I was saying a moment ago with Jan, is that those, those less vulnerable people who used to be less vulnerable are actually just as vulnerable to the things that are lighter, right? That are that softer version of the harmful narrative, right? So you have to watch out for those different flavors, those different grades of the same base conspiracy or hoax or harmful content. Please, uh, thanks. Please, uh, Daniel and then Ashish. Ah, yes, uh, I can, I guess, connect very well to that because um, there was a huge claim actually in your presentation and that went by quite fast was that everybody who uses internet is subject to manipulation. And I'm not quite sure if I would subscribe to that. Um, I rather would want to suggest that um, the people you are thinking about that you are like also maybe uh, observing uh, with your data is a cohort in itself, right? There are people who are dragged into this internet culture, I want to say, and then bring it back again into the political discourse. But I'm not quite sure if this is 100% of, of internet users. I think there is still, at least uh, from my social direct observations around me, the people are able to use the internet strategically specifically to inform themselves to digest and uh, yeah to do what a critical mindset would do evaluate uh, to question if this is genuine content yes or not these are things that are not all of a sudden forgotten and um, i understand that in america the situation uh, seems so out of hand that it might be seeming as it as it is omnipresent but i also want to remind that these are very loud discourses. They're shouting and screaming all the time. You can't even he look and hear away. So they're also attention grabbers and therefore you don't even notice those people who don't pay so much attention to that. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Let, let's let's combine with, with Ashish. Uh, sure. Abasi, please. Sound. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, so, uh, sorry. Um, so this isn't something that, 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 that I have much inside knowledge of. Uh, so forgive the naive question. Um, this sounds a lot to me like what us economists refer to as Baumol's cost disease at work. That is to say, spreading disinformation is an increasing returns to scale activity uh, with these new technologies. Stopping disinformation is not an increasing returns to scale activity unless you know some of the tools you're developing sort of seem to work. When you're dealing with a situation like that, it seems like you need big policy actions to stop the problem. You've got to sort of stop it at the source. And one of the sources here seems to be people operating anonymously on the internet, right? Projecting... Uh, so asserting a right to free speech that is reserved for individuals who exist, and yet these are people who do not exist or do not exist in the ways they purport to exist. Uh, is there a way to actually deal with that, to make sure that when somebody says something on the internet, they've got to be who they say they are? And you know, what are the barriers to getting that done? Mm -hmm. And would that help? Yeah, uh, I'll answer this one first and, and, and go back to the, uh, to the other one. Um, so, um, that is a, a, a point that a number of people have discussed in the, in the policy space recently, which is like mandatory verification, right? Um, and it's, I mean, certainly easier said than done on the current systems that we have today, but it's one of the ways in which like in the future, if, if, if we say that it's gonna go the way we've been describing today, once the information, bad information goes up, a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand percent, you're probably very likely going to have to ignore, unless major changes in the platform, just saying everything remains the same, you're going to have to ignore everything that hasn't been verified, right? Or where a person is not verified. Now, you could choose to make that decision today as well. Like, hey, I know this person on Facebook, um, or I know that this is a news organization because I did a little work or I've heard of them before. But again, it requires work on the part of the, the end user. So 
if you're going to do a verification system and there's many many companies that have systems like this today online but it's a lot of work so people don't really utilize them the platforms are not going to want to utilize it as much because it's a barrier to entry and it's all about frictionless signups and frictionless activity on their platforms and this is again an economic incentive to get people on fast on board them advertise to them so they're not going to buy into this verified everyone unless you force them right but it is a good approach um, now, you also have a whole reasonably well-heeled section of the world in the crypto space and blockchain space today. And we're talking about literally thousands of minted new billionaires and hundred millionaires who strongly believe in anonymity, right? And it's actually more about becoming further anonymous. Some people have you know kind of said you have this cancel culture group that is highly anti-cancel culture and one approach to that is okay everyone has an anonymous pseudonym so that you can say whatever you want and you have true freedom of speech and your professional uh you know kind of person or profile is going to be the one where you're more careful right so you actually have a huge clash of incentives and desires here where one group is going to want full verification for everyone. No one's on the internet saying anything unless you are who you say you are. And another group that says everyone should have the right to anonymity, right? There's not a great answer to that because even going back to major movements, anonymity is a big piece of getting things done without persecution, right? Pen names have been around for a long time as well since this is very, very early writing where people will write under a fictitious name to protect their identity, right? So that is a challenging question, an unsolved question, but it's one approach that people are talking about, right? Twitter has the verified check, but they stopped the program years ago. It's very, very slow now, right? And you have people who are verified who spread disinformation on a regular basis, right? Nothing's to say your verified account isn't going to start spreading disinformation the day after it gets verification in a new model either, right? So you have to also constantly monitor their content. So challenges uh, abound, right? So, um, you know, the other question about everyone being manipulated, everyone is subject to manipulation using the internet, meaning you are viewing things that you did not know if they were true or not. I'm not saying, uh, Daniel, that everyone fell for everything hook, line, and sinker, but if you use the internet, it's very likely you've been manipulated somewhere, and it's not just the big things. It could be that you've been tracked by uh, you know a number of organizations who are now feeding you information that you didn't want to see because they understand your behavior, your psychographic behavior, your browsing patterns, things of that nature. They're feeding you products or things that you may not have wanted to see. And those are the same mechanisms disinformation uses to feed you content that they think you're going to be more likely to buy into. Um, there are, of course, plenty of people who are critical thinkers and still drive value out of the internet today, but even myself, I've been fascinated at hearing about um, the number of disinformation campaigns over the years that we've kind of heard just around us in the culture that were started with a very specific motive, right? Um, and so perfect example that, that comes to mind is that there are a large number of people that still believe that the US government uh, created the HIV virus, right? Um, and this was actually a, a Russian disinformation campaign that was spun up in the 80s. It took a full year to actually land on the nightly news coming out of Dan Rather's mouth, right? Um, today, it can happen overnight, and you can test far more uh, campaigns than you ever could back then at far lower cost. So if you're on the Internet, you're potentially uh, a manipulation uh, target, and you've very likely seen a large number of things that you did not know were authentic or not because there's just too much information to verify. So that's kind of really what I mean by that. I think we all still have our, our critical thinking skills about us, but I don't know that everyone really utilizes it all the time anymore, right? Especially online. So that's how I would speak to that. Can I slip in a question in relation to this, Avasim? The, if we think of today's news, the developments in the Republican Party, which are aimed at the next elections, 
these elections may derail the new New Deal and the Green New Deal, which is supported by the Biden, led by the Biden administration. So the odds are, are enormous. If we think of Bolsonaro in Brazil and Modi in India, and the whole Bollywood entertainment info news, uh, info entertainment industry that he is related with. Again, the odds are tremendous. And you mentioned earlier uh, the gap between actual situations and media reporting, media ecosystem culture which in India is so glaring, and you say, well, there are other examples of that in which the world knows, but the citizens do not know. What other examples are you thinking of? And given the magnitude of the odds, what can we do now? What is the top agenda now? Well, you know, when you think about the and what is what is can you just simplify the question a little bit um so that uh so that I can all right number one uh, Vazim, the odds are large and they are imminent they are immediate upcoming elections united states odds in in india um a, a big gap as you said between actual situation and um uh, information ecosystem. Uh, in Brazil, similarly, though not as glaring. These odds are huge. They affect millions. Imminently now, because we have talked about many issues very, uh, very sagely. What are the instruments on the agenda as you see it now? Uh, well, don't you, do, you are talking specifically to narrative manipulation, um, or yes, uh, uh, actionable items. Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly it's it's going to be par for the course if one party wins over another that they tend to like to derail whatever the last one did. So I don't see um, you know much change there. Uh, I suppose at least here in the U.S. Um, but you know, I think one thing that we can think about is just what um, what efforts uh, countries take to, 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 to shape their positioning in other countries, right? Um, one thing that comes to mind is, uh, you know, China owns a lot of the movie theaters in the U.S., right? And so you're not going to see villains portrayed by um, Chinese governments, right? That, that's just a, it's a really interesting and shrewd move over the last 10 years where they, they own AMC. Uh, I think they own a number of other studios. Um, you know, a lot of the other countries that could have afforded that kind of thing never thought to do it. Um, but that's why you don't see villains in our movies um, in, in the U.S. here, right? Um, from China or the CCP. So Hollywood uh, can no longer function without Beijing vote. Yeah, they, they, they need the money too, right? Or they'll take the yeah. money away, right? So... Um, and so it, it's going to be a lot about how the context of how all of these different groups present themselves to the world and popular opinion, I think is going to drive it because it's popular opinion that drives everything now. Um, and that's why the forces around this information ecosystem that we're looking at are, are so strong and so motivated. Um, because like anything, if you control people's perceptions, you control elections, you control uh, the money flows, the financial markets, um, you know, society at large. So that is why we in particular look at manipulation because that's what's going to drive people's behavior. Um, and so, again, that's that's kind of where we focus and that's kind of more my, my wheelhouse, I suppose. Uh, Basim, can you share the latest report of vaccines on anti-vaccine disinfo? So, so we can post it to the audience of this colloquium. That would be great. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to 
call out um, on the great work that, that Bert did on this uh, on this report as well. Um, we are huge fans of Bert and her work on uh, on what we do at Blackbird. But yes, absolutely, we will we will definitely uh, push that over. Uh, uh, thanks, Vasim. Uh, folks, other question? We have a minute or so. If not, wonderful. Um, Wasim, cordial thanks to you. This is really insightful and uh, stimulates many, many uh, reflections as well as reflections on reflections. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, so thank, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks to everybody. Uh, Bert, nice to see you. Mark, also nice to see you. Nice to see you all, folks. Thanks. Thank, thanks a lot, Wasim. Marvelous. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, talk to everyone later. Bye bye. Okay. So, super. so just to, just to, just to add next week. Um, next week we're going to be hosting Daya Tusu, uh, who's going to be giving a talk about the the BRICS uh, de-Americanizing the internet, which should be interesting. So, thanks everybody. Thanks, for Brett. Me. All right. Thanks. Thanks oh, everybody. Nice Hi. Uh, nice to see you, Brett. Uh, Bert. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right.